do the countdown. Oh, it started now. So the recording. So you'll send it to me, Dave, after. Okay. All right. All right. We All right. transfer. All right. Yes, we transfer some. Countdown in five, four, three, two, one. Hi, everyone, and welcome. And we're back to the Neil Haley Show here on the Caregiver Dave Celebrity Segment. And I'm excited to welcome the program Caregiver Dave Nassani. Dave, what's going <laughs> on, man? How are you? I'm doing awesome. Uh, got over my Omicron and my energy is coming back and I'm in Southern California and it's sunny. It just doesn't get any better than that. Exactly. And I have on uh, as our guest today, Peter Kleins. He is a New York Times bestselling author, author of Broken Room. How are you, Peter? Thanks for stopping by, man. Hey, thanks for having me. I'm doing pretty good. Uh, all right, so I'm going to just jump right into this because it's a mixture of horror. I hear Stranger Things. I'm liking when I hear Stranger Things because I love Stranger Things, to tell you the truth. But let's learn a little bit about you, your background as an author, and how that journey began. Because I think one of the things, everyone wants that New York Times bestselling author uh, moniker. I think that if any author, if you went and asked them, you know, bestselling author would be their first thing, the New York Times would be the one that say, if I could say, I'm a New York Times bestselling author. So how did that journey begin as a writer? And I add one more thing to that, Neil, too. Uh, sell a million books. <laughs> <laughs> um, honestly, I, I have probably the absolute worst path anyone could follow to becoming a successful author. Um, there's, there's no rhyme or reason to it at all. <laughs> uh, I've, like a lot of people, you know, who write, I've wanted to write since I was a little kid. I've told stories since I was a little kid. Um, but like for the longest time, it never occurred to me that this is something people could actually do for a living. <laughs> so I always just thought it was like this weird side dream that I'd, I'd go be an aerospace engineer or something and, or a high school teacher and maybe just write stories when I could. Uh, but yeah, I actually really enough got out of college with a degree I could not use at the time moved randomly to California from New England, uh, ended up in the film industry, got out of the film industry, started writing about the film industry, um, and then somewhere in there transitioned just writing fiction full time. I, I sold my first novel to a small press, my first four novels to a small press, uh, and then I got picked up by Random House, and my seventh book, Eighth book was the one that hit the New York Times bestseller list. Am I counting that right? Uh, I think I'm counting well, that right. So you kept <laughs> writing and your publisher was happy with you. And then your fans started to build up. Would you say fan base has a lot to do with it at times too? Well, I mean, building that fan. I guess it's 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 such a tough thing to say because you can it's possible to build your fan base with your first book. Um, you know, you look at somebody, uh, look at Andy Weir, for example first book becomes a smash runaway hit and he'd he'd written novels before that or I think he wrote a novel before that he wrote a very popular short story before that but The Martian was just this he came out of nowhere as people like to say even though he'd been writing for years mm. um I you know went the other way I just had like this very small build up build up build up I did not really have a a breakout hit I guess in any way until my fourth novel which was a horror adventure mystery thing called 14 uh but i there is no one path i wish i could really say it's and i did this and became a new york times best-selling author i used well, the you, word you, melon you, baller you, three times so, so you can create that course right how to become a new york times best-selling <laughs> author by peter Kleins. No, and anyone who's selling that course is lying to you <laughs> <laughs> and there is the course but you could google it right now Oh, uh, absolutely. I'm, I'm sure there are a dozen courses like that. There are courses and webinars and, and how-to books, and they're all crap. Toss them. <laughs> so you're a New York Times bestselling author. Every author aspires to be that. I'm an author. I certainly am. I've got a book coming out. But uh, a lot of mystery around what it takes. Does it take uh, book sales? Does it take you know, uh, a popular political uh, topic or staying away from a negative political topic. I mean, what's your opinion? I, I think, again, it, there is no one path. I, a friend of mine, I will be polite and not name them, but they're also New York Times bestselling author. And when they heard that, that they had hit the New York Times bestseller list, 
they were ecstatic because they were figuring like, oh my God, this book took off. I must have sold, you know, half a million copies. How many, was it half a million? Was it a quarter million? Because half a million, how many million did we sell? And like, you sold like, like 9,000. It was a yeah, slow week. That's what I'm talking about. That, that's just it though. It's, it's honestly, it's best example. Do you remember there was a story at the start of the pandemic about these two guys who had made a short film and they rented out a theater and bought all the seats. And because of this, they were number one at the box office because nothing else was released that week. So they were the number one movie in America. So they with manipulated. One th- with one theater screen with like 80 seats, 100 seats, I think, something, something very small like that. But they were number one in America. They didn't, it wasn't really manipulated. It's just that number one sort of depends on a lot of other factors. So I hit number four. Um, but it was also a very weird week because I hit number four and my book had been out for like three months at that point. Mm. And then just randomly one week I hit number four on the New York Times bestseller list. Um, the book ahead of me, I think, was uh crap, I just blanked, but it was another book that had like been out for a while. And I I have no idea what happened. So the perfect but, storm. Yeah, it's just some it sometimes you can hit the New York Times bestsellers with a book that's selling like mad. Sometimes you hit it with you know, just because it was a slow week, I guess, in my case. Um, I have a friend who's written tons of original stuff that's amazing, and he hit the New York Times bestseller with a movie adaptation he did. Wow. So I I don't think there is anything. The, the thing I would always tell people really is don't don't worry about hitting the New York Times bestseller Don't worry about that. Don't Don't try to make something or craft it for that purpose just write the the best story you can write the story you want to tell because if you're writing a really good story that has a lot of heart behind it has a lot of feeling behind it that's what's going to connect with people and then they'll buy your your four thousand copies if it's a (laughs) story so is there a club for it now once you become a new york times best-selling author you is there a club of people because not everyone reaches that if there is i have not been invited to it (laughs) You have a friend in it, but the, the, he, he's not telling you yet, right? I've got a, I've got a couple friends at this point who have, and it's it still weirds me out, A, that I personally know a bunch of people in the New York Times best selling list, and then I sort of stop and think, wait, I'm a person on the New, who hit the New York Times bestsellers list, which is is still bizarre to me. Yeah, When I see that in print or something, it makes no sense. And I know a friend who's the New York Times number one best-selling author, but how does she make it? Well, Oprah just happened to endorse her book, you know. Yeah, it's that's just it. It's it's so weird and so random. And I, I guess I always expected when I was like starting out when I was a kid that it would change everything, you know, that I'd I'd have a gold plated car or something now that I'm, I'm just like, <laughs> or at least a pink Cadillac. Or or something, yeah. You know, that there you'd get a plaque or something. <laughs> now you're gonna get the license plate, right? New York yeah. Times bestseller. <laughs> Uh, it's a frame on it. <laughs> exactly. All right. So let's talk about the book now. I mean, so is this a series or is it, or you're right, uh, of, this, you've written eight books. Of, is it a series or is this just this book that you're, we're, we're talking about right now is more uh, the first of a potential series? Um, I never trained, I never, I shouldn't say never. I very, very, very rarely when I write a book, think, could this be the start of a series? Um, Because again, I think that's sort of like shooting yourself in the foot and asking for trouble. If I, like, um, I know everyone says like, oh, but publishers want to see a series. Publishers want to see a series. My personal belief and from talking with editors and stuff, what I think they want is they want to see a book with serious potential. That they like this book. It's a good, solid book. But if you wanted to tell another story, set in this world another story with these characters you could um i don't think they want you to send in your first novel and it has to be continued on the last page and you haven't answered anything um so all that said i just wrote this book as a standalone um like a lot of my books there's a couple little weird easter eggs in it like hints to other things but 
uh, it is a mostly complete standalone. It is a complete standalone. You don't need to read any of my other books. I currently have no plans to write another book with these characters, but you know, never say never. If 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 come release day this book sells 10 million copies, I'm sure the publishers might have different opinions on if <laughs> yeah. So um that's kind of where it is now. It it was a a story that popped in my head and I wanted to tell it. And I, I'd actually been telling my agent I was going to write a different book. And so when I turned this in, he got it and he was like, what is this? And I was like, just read it, just read it, you'll like it. <laughs> so so when you were younger, you said you, you like to uh, write and all of that stuff. Uh, were you writing fiction or were you telling true stories? And then when you had your job uh, in the film industry and you were writing about that, where, was there fiction in that? Was it just all reality? How did this all start? Um, well, when I was a little kid, it was mostly what what I think we would today call fan fiction stuff. Um, I mean, I started out, I, I was of the Star Wars generation. And yes. <laughs> I, had, um, I would set up every night. I still remember this. My mom still remembers this. I would set up like little dioramas with all my action, my Star Wars action figures. And every day, like every night before I went to bed, I would explain to her how everything had changed, that this guy had moved over here and this had happened and he saw him. And now this guy is running that way and, you know, all that sort of stuff. Um, and and then very interested, of course. Oh, my mom was a saint, is a saint, <laughs> because she she would listen to me go on and on. And none of this stuff has any interest to her. She is not a sci fi fan. She's not you know, into any of this. And she would sit there and nod and encourage me and tell me it was really good when I was writing this bizarre stuff that I think she had no clue, you know, what to make of it. And at one point I found she had this massive electric typewriter uh, from when she'd been a student and like gone to finishing school. And I found this thing. And now I know I was writing real stories because they were typed. So, you know, I'm nine using this massive typewriter. And it's one of those things where like you turn it on and it's like humming and shaking the whole desk. Right. You know, you can, you like hear the power up, like when you turn it on, it's like. Were you a uh, uh, only child? I was not. Uh, my brother and I are almost exact opposites. My brother <laughs> is the sports nut. Uh, he's really into music. Uh, so we weren't doing much. He would be outside doing stuff and I would just be sitting at the desk typing away. So uh, when I got into the film industry, that was actually a weird stumbling thing, but I was actually doing art stuff. I was a prop master for many years okay. on a bunch of movies and TV shows. Um, so did and you I would up fiction stories uh, during that time, or I, I would actually I tried I tried to write scripts during it. I wrote scripts for a couple of shows I was working on, and tried to show them to the right people. Uh, I what tried, shows did you What shows did you work on? Um, I worked on probably the two biggest shows that people would know that I worked on. Uh, I worked on a USA show called Silk Stockings. I know like, that show. I remember it was like show. a sexy police crime show. Yeah. Uh, that ran for nine years, eight years. Uh, and I worked on that for about three years. Uh, I also worked on a show called Veronica Mars. I've heard that. Too. Yep. Uh, and probably the only other thing I've worked on that people would really have heard of, if not watched, probably deliberately, was a bad superhero show called Nightman. Okay. Um, and if you didn't hear, hear that, don't worry about it. You should feel very relieved that you've never heard of it. I didn't. I didn't. So there you go. So let's yeah. talk about, you know, what I'm always interested in is, you know, why horror? You're, why is horror, John, you're interested in horror? I don't know if it's an interest. I think it's just the way I tell stories. I think, uh, I, I think a lot of people aren't so much interested in, like, Believe it or not, I don't watch a lot of horror. Like I, I read horror novels, but I read a lot of other stuff too. I read comedy, I read sci-fi, I read mysteries. I'm a big Jack Reacher fan. Um, but I don't know, I just, whenever I, whenever I sit down, things almost invariably start spinning towards weird and creepy and, you know, no matter how, I, I have tried again and again to just write, okay, I'm just gonna write a straight sci-fi novel. And whenever I do, just all this weird little darkness, creepy stuff starts leaking in. And 
I don't know. I guess it's it's partly just the way my brain's wired for yeah. for telling stories that these are this is the reaction I like getting from people. This is the you know it's the raw moments I guess that I like that stick that stick with me and stuff. So where do you find the time to read? Uh, you know, when you're not writing, uh, do you read mm -hmm. while you're writing? I mean. How much of your time is actually reading other people's stuff? A fair amount. I mean, I try to read at least an hour or two every day. Um, Just because you love know. it or you have a motive? Because I love it. Hear, well, I mean, it's 50-50. I also have like the stack of like, all right, I, I need to do a blurb for this person and a blurb for this person. And I'm helping this friend, you know, just skimming through their book and giving them notes because they've helped me out at times. Um, and there's stuff I like, you know, there's stuff that, oh my God, look, they finally made a Bakru Banzai novel, you know, they did this, they did this. And those are things that I scoop up. I have friends who write books I love, you know, there's like, I have my book coming out March 1st, but like there's five other books coming out this month that I've been like eagerly awaiting from different authors I know. So I just, I, I also have the advantage I am doing this full time at this point. Yeah, That's you're, reading, you're, reading more than, you're reading more than just fiction, right? I read everything. I read fiction. I have nonfiction. Um, I, I read articles. I, I go through so much stuff all the time because everything interests me. I just, I, I, if, if it's one of those things where like you look back and you think, man, if I'd known where I'd be now, I would have done so much more in college. I would have taken this random course and that random course. And I want, I, cause I just want to know stuff. And I'm very lucky that I have a lot of very, educated friends i know you know doctors i know genetic engineers i know biochemists and it's fun talking to them but it's also fun like they're, they're great for research yeah. i can call people up I, I know a guy who's an expert on ai in computers and he and i actually had a whole talk recently about okay do you know what a turing test is if you're familiar with the idea um no. okay a turing test is this idea that was come up with a while back essentially it's how do you tell if a computer is thinking or not okay as opposed to is it just giving you sort of pre-programmed responses and i had this wild idea of could you apply a turing test to a ghost <laughs> so is the ghost actually conscious or is the ghost just sort of repeating echoing things from its life exactly <laughs> yeah and well and I know, I know people that I get to sit and have conversations like that with. And That's fantastic. Well, what's your family life like? Uh, are you married? You got kids? No kids. Uh, I'm not married, but I've been with the same partner now for we're coming up on 18 years together. Um, and they're compatible so with your writing habits. And uh... <laughs> she is. She's also a writer, um, and that is how we met. We met weirdly enough at the wake for a friend's cat. <laughs> and we had been writing for I mentioned I, I wrote about the movie industry for a while we both worked at the same magazine and we had just never met each other oh wow um so because you know it's like you work for a magazine I was always out in the field she was usually in the office and we were both writers and we met started talking to each other that night and like the next day we were emailing each other like hey had a good time last night and then uh you know, here we are. Coming All up right. On so tell years. us the quick premise of the book. Uh, so people that can pick it up, uh, tell us a little bit about the book. Mm -hmm. Quick premise of the book. Uh, essentially, the book is about a former secret agent named Hector, who has become very disillusioned, who became very disillusioned with his job, dropped out, fell off the grid. And one day, this little girl shows up, basically claiming to have been sent by one of Hector's old companions, friends. And Hector is immediately suspicious because this guy who she claims she talked to just a couple of days ago has been dead for seven years. Um, at which point she explains like, oh, thank God, you know, I, he was worried I'd, I'd be the one to have to break it to you. And what we come to find out is through a whole thing that is a big part of the book is the ghost of this dead secret agent is stuck in Natalie's head. And oh wow! so Natalie can talk to him, hear him, he can tell her stuff. Um, and basically he has sent Natalie to track down Hector to help her. And because the people who did this to her are trying to get her back. 
So I think that's in, really interesting. Have you thought of any of your books to be a, a, a to utilize for a potential series or anything, or any of the or a movie? Oh, have who you hasn't? I mean, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I'd love it. Obviously, if they did very very funny story when I started writing this, the person I was picturing as Hector was Pedro Pascal, and. I got about three, four chapters in this. It's like, yeah, oh my God, Pedro Pascal would be fantastic at this. And I could totally see him like protecting a little kid, being that kind of badass guy. And literally about a week after I said this, because I was like, and he's in that new Mandalorian show that's coming out. Yeah. And the Mandalorian came out. I'm like, God damn it. Now he's never going to do my movie. <laughs> but I mean, that's the dream. Uh, I have some things that are kind of in the works right now actually that i don't think i can talk about yet i'm sure you can't uh, talk about it yet yeah. that's the but that's but, the it, thing. but it's the dream you know that hey that's this is what's great is you're doing what you love and you're enjoying what it is and, and really seeing this whole process of people thinking they're not reading books yet they still are and it's great and more and more books are being written and people need to definitely stay the course like you have and then you got that opportunity as new york times best-selling author and then that will lead to more and more opportunities. All right, Dave, here, here's Dave's final question. Why we call him caregiver Dave in the sandy. Go ahead, Dave. <laughs> Excuse me. So I became a caregiver uh, 25 years ago. My wife had a stroke, lost her speech, became paralyzed on one side. And I instantly was thrown into this world. And, and I realized how hard it was. And, and I was burning out, grieving, all of that stuff. And we finally got it together. She reinvented herself and uh, I reinvented myself. And now I help other caregivers stay alive because 30% of them actually die before their loved ones do. And many more become sicker than the ones they care for, eventually needing a caregiver of their own. So I started caregiverdave.com. It's an online support group. And I've appeared on 51 TV shows just uh, talking about how to stay alive. You know, if you're a caregiver, put your mask on first. And I've spoken all over the country, all over the world, actually. My question to you, Peter, is um, how has caregiving affected your life, you know, with any parents, grandparents? I don't know. I, I've been extremely fortunate that most of my family, we are disgustingly long lived. <laughs> um, and I, I'm in this very weird position. This is the actual truth. I've only had like four relatives die in wow. my entire life. Oh, wow. Um, and I, I have some ancient relatives my i still have both my parents i have uh i've lost one aunt and my grandmother and that's pretty much been it on that side of my family mm. uh but Did i they actually go quickly grew, or was it a long prolonged uh it was actually pretty quick for both that's of them. A blessing. My, my aunt went quickly and with a lot of grace my grandmother um had complications from surgery and a week later was, um, but both times were very peaceful for them. Uh, so I've been very fortunate that way. Um, but I think it's, th in this day and age, I think that's a wonderful thing you're doing because it is, I see looming crisis for a lot of us that I think yeah. a lot more people are, are one way or another going to be Either, either needing a caregiver or finding themselves in that position of being yeah. a caregiver. Do you know any um, caregivers who are going through this stuff? Not at the moment. I used to. I actually had a friend in college, two friends, who helped take care of another student who was in a wheelchair mm. um, and needed assistance. Um, How'd they handle it? They did fairly well. They, I think for everyone involved, it was the sort of thing that they were they they were we were all young enough i mean i was friends with him too that none of us considered it in any way i guess that i think and you would probably have a much better perspective of this than i do i think for some people it's probably very and it sounds like it sounds like such a cheap word but just rough to go from having a full you know mobile vibrant life and then suddenly finding out oh I'm bedridden now. Oh, right. I'm, you know, that, that, exactly. it, that, that besides the, whatever has, has done this to you, just the idea that it ha the idea that it has happened to you, that the, the change of life is just as probably destructive for some people as whatever disease accident condition has caused it. Yeah. So, all right. 
Okay. So caregiverdave.com. Again, we can purchase your book. It's available March, right? March 5th releases? March 1st. March, March 1st. 1st. Yep. Everywhere. March, everywhere. All right. Fantastic. All right. So March 1st, everywhere. And do you have a website too? Uh, I'm at peterkleins.com. I am Peter Kleins on Twitter, Peter Kleins on Instagram. Very easy to find. You know, you're fantastic. It was great talking to you. Good discussion. I guess, we, you, you know, uh, the, a course, how to become a New York Times bestselling author. We're finding out. No, that's not the best path. It's just stay the course, keep going. And I appreciate it. All right. Thank you very much for having me. All right. Thanks, guys. Thank appreciate it. Time. All right. That was the Caregiver Dave celebrity segment. Guys, take care. You can stop the recording, Dave. Okay.